We've been keeping count and we've just about reached 100 episodes of Cinefix Movie Lists. And so, we're interrupting your regularly scheduled program for something a little different. For number 98, I'm turning it over to our writer, Billy Jackson, to give you his top 10 films of all time. I've wanted to kind of step out from behind the curtain, as it were, for a while now and give you all an opportunity to meet the person Cinefix has deciding what the top 10 best whatever of all time are because, well, it's me. And the way I eventually decided I want to do that is by going back through my own entire history with movies and kind of trace all the most important ones that have brought me and my tastes to where they are today. So with that being said, first, I'm turning to my earliest childhood years. Now, I don't have any specific memories of watching movies during this time in my life, but I do have memories of the movies that I know I did watch, and most of all, I remember how some of those movies made me feel. I remember a gleeful delight with Robin Williams' Batty and Fern Gully. I know I knew every song of the criminally underrated Muppets' Treasure Island, and I remember lazing along down the river with Mowgli and Baloo in Jungle Book. But if I think back to the childhood movie about which I feel strongest, there's nothing that really gets me quite like The Lion King did. That first shot, that opening image and call to song is probably the most enduring cinema moment in all of my memory. More than the plot or the characters or the father-son Hamlet thematics of the film, what I really think of when I think of The Lion King is just that. And I wonder if that isn't probably where we all start with movies, at a place where sound and image combine that hits us somewhere deep in the gut and makes us feel. I mean, maybe that sounds kind of elementary to some people, like, yeah, duh, that's what movies do. But over and over in my time here working on movie lists, I kind of keep coming back in awe to this idea that these pictures and noises and words make my brain jump and sing in these utterly surprising ways. So that's where movies started for me, with the feeling of a new day's sunrise, the optimism of birth, the hope of new beginnings. With hope. Movies started for me with hope. In contrast to this hope, the other feeling I remember most intensely from this period of my life is that of fear and dread. I think it's easy to forget how much scarier scary things were when you were a kid. Now, I watch a good horror film, I jump a couple times, I get my heart rate up, and then the credits roll, and I brush my teeth, I go to bed, and I sleep great. As a kid, a good scare could ruin my whole week. All I have to do to confirm this is look back over the pile of VHS tapes in my parents' attic, and some of the more traumatic memories come rushing back. The Chokey and Matilda, the Sky Rhino from James and the Giant Peach, The Pit from Homeward Bound, but if I had to pick the one film from this period that has most permanently etched itself into my nightmares, it would have to be The Brave Little Toaster. I can't help it if the kid was too short to reach my dials! We didn't mean it! Really? It's my function! Don't! Wait! Wait! He's gonna grow! Don't get me wrong, I absolutely adored The Brave Little Toaster, but I cannot express emphatically enough how psychologically unprepared I was at age five or so for an anthropomorphic air conditioner suicide. There's a serious existential edge to the fear The Brave Little Toaster trades on, and not even just here. It's almost Freudian in a lot of ways, and I think that pattern resurfaces in my preferences later on on this list, as well as in some of the movie lists I've produced here at Cinefix. But whether it comes from The Brave Little Toaster or is just first reflected there, there's no doubt that a preference for existential dread was a very early feature of my relationship with movies. I think if I first responded to the raw emotional potential of filmmaking, I next remember the movies that gave me protagonists to look up to. And my first favorite heroes to pretend to be were Knights with Swords. This was Arthur from Sword in the Stone and Aragorn and Legolas from Lord of the Rings. It was even kind of a crowing, sword-wielding Rufio from Hook. But I also had a thing for kung fu films and their heroes. I can't remember the number of times I watched Iron Monkey and Legend of the Drunken Master. But when I was 10, kung fu movies just didn't get any better than Bruce Lee. Maybe it was because he was my dad's favorite. Maybe it was because because I accidentally saw my first pair of movie boobs in a Bruce Lee movie, or probably just because Bruce really is that good. So I think I've got to take two slots for my heroes here. Sir Ulrich von Lichtenstein from A Knight's Tale, and, well, Bruce Lee from Enter the Dragon. The 
The first time I saw A Knight's Tale, I went to the woods behind my best friend Nathan Gretz's house where we found an old stair railing to use as a lance, and I made him pull me in a handcart towards a stack of logs we'd fashioned as our jousting dummy. And I don't know what came first, Enter the Dragon or the Martial Arts, but I know that from about 10 to about 20, I took competitive Taekwondo pretty seriously. And that somewhere not quite in the back of my head was the thought of Bruce Lee and his inhuman speed that colored how I modeled myself as a fighter. I think in a really concrete way, movies can give us images of who we want to be. I know they did for me, and that can be really cool and inspiring. It can push us into play, or sport, or integral behavior, but it can also be a pretty damaging, unrealistic, standard-setting thing, especially when movies conjure up heroes who are unrealistically perfect. I think the sting of growing up to find that I don't quite stack up to the handsome, effortless, talented, brave, successful standards of Ulrich and Bruce might be part of the reason you'll see my tastes start to shift away from that kind of heroism towards more deeply flawed character pieces. As I grew into my teenage years, my father especially took it upon himself to make sure I received his version of a quality film education, and God, how I resisted it. All I wanted to do was make a nice, normal trip down to the Hollywood video store on the corner to get one of the cool new releases like Daredevil, or Anger Management, or Kangaroo Jack. And here he was, twisting my arm to watch some dreadfully dull old movie like Cool Hand Luke, or Goodfellas, or The Sting, or God forbid, The Godfather. In retrospect, I'm really glad he was just about as stubborn as I was, but of all the brilliant movies he forced me to watch, I think the one that's made the most lasting impression has to be Apocalypse Now. Someday this war's gonna end. The first thing I remember about Apocalypse Now is that I gave up about 20 minutes through, which means I watched this all-time great opening sequence and then thought, eh, rather not. But with a couple more years of attention span under my belt, I finally made it through and my god was my dad right. And I think sharing his favorite films with me has actually been a really important part of our relationship. Sharing art is like sharing a piece of yourself. Saying, watch this film, I think you'll like it, is kind of like saying, these noises and colors smash up against my insides and give me some crazy feelings and I'd like you to feel the same ones because they felt kind of important to me. Especially as men raised in a culture and, frankly, a family where speaking openly about our insides wasn't always the easiest thing to do, sharing movies was a way for my father to emotionally connect with me even without the words to necessarily talk about it. And for that, I have to say thanks, Dad. Taste in art is a funny, incredibly subjective thing. It's interesting to look back at all the twists and turns mine has taken and see how personal it really is. How the same movie at different times has given me completely different viewing experiences. My high school years would see me, like many high schoolers I'm sure, forming strong, unchangeable opinions that I would later come back to completely flip. I was trying to build an identity, and a big part of an identity is a sense of personal aesthetics. And the 15-year-old anarchist and rebel in me loves stuff like Fight Club and The Matrix, both of which I still really stand behind, and American Beauty which I really still don't. But the movie I saw in this period of my life that remains the most important to me has to be No Country for Old Men, which I saw in theaters with my new best friend Matt and my father and absolutely hated. I always figured when I got older, God would sort of come into my life somehow. And he didn't. I mean, nothing happened. There wasn't any ending, and what ending there was didn't even happen on screen. Yeah, sure, Apocalypse Now was a head trip, but at least Colonel Kurtz got his in the end. Of course, nowadays I think the film is brilliant in about a half a million different ways and have included it on maybe too many brilliant moments lists because of that, but at age 16, when it first came out, my god was it frustrating. The truth is, I was a different person back then when I saw it for the first time, not only in terms of my personality and development, but also in terms of my familiarity with the century-long ongoing conversation that is world cinema. Cinema happens in context. It's a language with its own literacy. It's why history is important and why foreign films can be as daunting as they are rewarding. In a lot of ways, this was one of my first encounters with a non-classical Hollywood narrative. And it's easy to forget how narrow the shape of mainstream films can be and how foreign it can feel to step outside of it for the first time. By 18, I had enrolled in engineering college with only the vaguest of notions that I might also have an interest in film. Inspired mostly by how much I enjoyed making ridiculous Lonely Island parodies on my DV camera with my equally ridiculous high school friends. But I enrolled in a film elective my very first semester to give it a look. And that first semester was filled with films I would have otherwise stuck my nose up at but ended up loving like Citizen Kane and The Third Man and M. And in just my first week as I learned that four years of engineering school was going to be a very boring affair, we screened our first film in that first film class, and I marched out of it, called my parents, and told them what every pair of respectable middle class parents want to hear from their son, that I was going to be a film major. And that film was The Five Obstructions. My plan with this is to go from the perfect to the human. Yeah. That's like my... 
agenda eller hvad du oh, okay. kan okay. The Five Obstructions was a film about filmmaking, about an oddly competitive challenge between a mentor and a former student to remake the mentor's, in my opinion, pretty damn artsy-fartsy short film five times with increasingly confounding obstacles. But the whole thing was fascinating to me. These guys were over here dueling over this obscure short that was far more opaque than No Country Ever was, and yet, I still got the feeling that they were really playing for keeps. That beyond the inexplicable finger-snapping riddle of the perfect human were two people actively grappling with the big answers to the big questions. That really appealed to me at that age. I was 18, had myself a lot of big questions, and I figured that maybe these movie things could help me answer them. This search for movies with answers finally took me off the beaten path of film towards what would eventually become the basis for my own tastes. But I couldn't stomach just jumping straight into the deep end of the avant-garde yet, so I walked myself slowly towards the indie and the cult, gravitating towards those headier offerings with a clear philosophical bent. I reevaluated the Coens and fell in love with a serious man and all of its inscrutable religious questing, but the creator I responded to most at this age ended up being Charlie Kaufman. At first it was just his writing, being John Malkovich an adaptation particularly rocked my world, but it was his directorial debut, Synecdoche, New York, that became my new all-time fave. What was once before you, an exciting, mysterious future, is now behind you. Lived, understood, disappointing. You realize you are not special. You have struggled into existence and are now slipping silently out of it. This is everyone's experience, every single one. The specifics hardly matter. Everyone is everyone. Synecdoche felt like my first favorite that was really properly mine. I found it of my own searching, hadn't been handed it by anybody else, and it was like Charlie Kaufman was talking directly to me, like he was letting me in on his own radically beautiful perspective on what life was like. And arriving at the end of the film, I felt this really literally and explicitly, like I was there with Caden on the cusp of some final existential revelation with this oceanic feeling of wholeness. But that feeling never quite lasted more than a few hours, and when I learned that Synecdoche New York was really just Kaufman's attempt at an existential horror film, a grown-up brave little toaster meant to scare, not illuminate, it kind of ruined it for me for a little while. It's clear to me now that these filmmakers didn't have the answers I was looking for. Charlie Kaufman, Lars von Trier, they're incredible artists, but they're not exactly the picture of having it all figured out. But what they did have were the same questions, the same curiosity, the same desperate search. And what I was responding to, where that oceanic feeling really came from, was a sense of kindred experience. Instead of showing me who I wanted to be, like A Knight's Tale or Enter the Dragon, these films helped me ping against parts of who I already was. And that kind of insight and honesty, you've done an answer to life's fundamental questions still stands out as one of the most important abilities of any really good personal cinema. And really, that's what my big takeaway from this whole list is, that movies don't ever exist independently of their audiences, that making a top 10 list is inherently subjective 100% of the time, because we don't ever see just the movie, we participate in the viewership experience it creates. And that experience is half made up of the film, but half made up of who we are, which changes not only from person to person, but from year to year. By the time I had graduated from school, I had mostly grown out of the belief that movies could give me some kind of nebulous answer. And when I went to work for Cinefix, I was lucky enough to be asked to write movie lists and get to expose myself to tons more films on a weekly basis, even as I was forced to confront the impossible task of trying to rank things that by their very nature have no real rank. In doing so, I've made some lists I'm really proud of, and some others I'm really not. I've tried hard to focus on praising and sharing that which resonates with me as special, instead of disparaging that which doesn't. And along the way, early on, as I was putting together our list for the best long takes of all time, I discovered the movie that currently holds the crown atop my personal top whatever list. A movie which I'm sure comes as absolutely no surprise to any longtime movie list fan, Tarkovsky's The Mirror. Laika! Chivo!
The Mirror really truly does stir things up in me unlike any other film I've seen before or since. It works on me in the same way I imagine that the opening image of The Lion King worked on me at age 3. Deeply, intimately, personally, as if speaking directly to my soul. And I know it isn't for everybody. Even I'll admit that I find the first 20 minutes or so a kind of a slog. And that's the thing about cinema, and all of art really, is that as much as we would like to, and as much as it's literally my job to, nobody can tell you what's good or bad for anyone but themselves. Nobody can make you a top 10 list for you but you. If you like pretentious Russian art films and 90s Heath Ledger rom-coms, that's great, we've probably got a ton in common. But if you think Marvel movies are the best thing happening in cinema right now, that's great too. The next question isn't am I right or should I, it's why. What does that tell me about me, about how I move through the world and experience it? Because that's ultimately what I got with movies. Instead of answers to life's existential questions, I got clues to a roadmap about myself. And finally, in my last slot on this list, I got nothing. Partly because you've all spent four years and now 15 more minutes hearing from me, and I want to take this as an opportunity to hear from you and what your mirrors are and what's in your personal top 10 and why. But mostly, I'm leaving this spot blank because I only had nine good stories for you, and I hate making uneven numbered lists. Anyways, thank you for listening. This has been my 10, or nine, I guess, favorite films of all time. So, what do you think? What are the films that have been most important to you? Do you disagree with any of my picks? I don't know how you possibly could. That doesn't make any sense. Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix Movie Lists. God, I've always wanted to be the one to say that.